Hey guys, Lucas from To The Helpless here. We just edited our new EP, it's four tracks. The EP is called The Fringes of Normality. We're leaving with you the first track of the EP, Born To Lose, Death Comes Ripping. It talks about the theme of death seen through the, the prism of the pandemic. The EP was recorded by us here in Madrid, Spain. It was mastered by the one and only Master Genie, 90s punk hero. Hope you enjoy the song, you'll see it makes a quick nod to Death Comes Ripping by the Misfits. We really hope uh, you enjoy the song. Don't forget to check out the entire EP in any of your favorite streaming platforms. To the Helpless, The Fringes of Normality is the name of the EP. And this is Death Comes Ripping. Enjoy. <laughs> My name is Liam Bird and welcome to this fest-ish kind of uh, Punks in Pubs podcast special. I mean, uh, let's face it, 2020 has been fucking shit. COVID has made the name of this podcast redundant. Uh, there's only been one interview that I've done this year that was in a pub. And that was the one and only live show back in February at the uh, Signature Brew Bar. Since then, we have been doing Punks in Pubs via Zoom, and I fucking hate it, uh, but things are starting to look better in 2021. Uh, the vaccine is being rolled out, and I hope by the summer we might actually be Punks in Pubs once again. But right now, it's still quite bleak. As I speak, London has been put into a new lockdown uh, that has stopped families coming together for Christmas. It's not only... London also it is in the southeast and east of England. Uh, I mean, ugh, it's so fucking horrible. COVID has robbed so many of us of so many things. And I think for many, Christmas was something that they planned because essentially the UK government told them they could fucking do it. Only two days ago, they said that we could do this. 
And then they went back on their word and uh, they essentially told us that we couldn't go home for Christmas. Oh, I'm speaking on an emotional level because I understand that uh, science change and this, like the virus has supposedly morphed into something else, but the government should never have promised something that they knew that they couldn't guarantee. I mean, I fucking hate him. I, I, I hate Boris. <laughs> I hate the Tories. And I want to punch the stupid fucker in the fucking throat, the cunt. Keep it light, Liam. It's the Christmas special here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's just really frustrating. Uh, let's talk about my guest for this Christmas special. A man who I think will be in the queue with me to punch that melting snowman in the fucking throat. My guest for this Christmas special is the only man you think of when you think of Christmas. That's right. It's Steve Ignorant of Crass. Of course you think of Steve. Steve kindly spoke to me about his indifference on Christmas and his loathing for Christmas songs. He was really the perfect man to speak to about Christmas. Away from Christmas, Steve reveals that he auditioned for the global TV hit The Crown, uh, which is amazing. Steve also speaks about how, how seeing a skinhead play Scar sparked his love for music and how The Clash sparked his love for punk. We of course talk about Crass and his time in the band, as well as feeling lost once the band has split up. Steve also talks about his wish of wanting to work with Sleaford Mods and Bobby Vinyl. So we talk about that and a bit more. I'll be back after my chat with Steve, but enjoy this, this Christmas special with myself and Steve. Screen at me is a man who uh, most people will know as uh, one of the co-founders of the legendary punk band Crass. Steve, how are you? Born as a fiddle as fuck. <laughs> so Whatever that means. I have no idea. That just sounded like uh, some Cockney stuff that I've never heard in my life. No, uh, actually, I got it from a, an American book um, called uh, "P.S. Your Cat Is Dead." P.S. Your Cat Is Dead. Yeah, nothing to do with the TV program. There's a TV pro program called yeah, PS. Yeah, there was a there was a TV program called PS Your Cat Is Dead. I watched it, thinking yeah. it was going to be about the book, and it wasn't at all. And uh, was it about uh, the cat? Was what was it about? I'm now interested in to know what this this show's about. Oh, I can't. I'll switch it off, mate. As minute I realised it wasn't about the book, I was like, oh, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, let, let's start off then talking about the subject matter that's kind of rocked this year. The Crown. Are you watching it? No. Oh, mate, it's a great hate watch. Well, the funny thing is that I was invited last year. Uh, I was invited down. I, was, I suddenly got, got this email through. Um, we'll send you the script. Uh, we're from uh, this program called The Crown. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Uh, uh, we're doing a program about the 70s, and it's going to be when Michael, not Nyman, that's a bloody, uh, what's it, when Michael Fagin yeah, uh, yeah. breaks into the uh, Queen's bedroom. Yes. And we'd like you we'd like you to be an old man 
an old man that talked <laughs> to him in the street. And, I'm like, and the deal was, they sent me, so this is the night before, so I had to get up in the morning, they sent me the script through, um, I had to read it and try and learn it. The next day I had to go down to London, do the audition and come back. And the deal was, if I got the part, they'd pay for the um, expenses. Obviously, I never got the part. Because I was so fucking pissed off going all the way down there and they made me wait half an hour before I went into the actual audition. And all I could hear was like, when I was in um, Acapulco with um, working with Brad, um, Pip, you know, blah, 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 all these people younger than me fucking pissed off, walked in. And I was, How do you want me to do it? Well, just do it straight. Fucking looks right in a woman's eyes. Uh, and I think I frightened her, so I didn't get it. <laughs> Apart from that, I'm a shit actor. But... I was going to say, is acting something you, you've you've enjoyed? Is that something you've always wanted to follow? No, I've done it once. I did it once and I didn't realise how bloody hard it was. It was only, um, I was doing a play with a friend of mine called John Sharian. His name pops up in uh, places down again. And he put on a play at the Man in the Moon Theatre, King's Road, 1990-something. I played the lead part uh, of a, a play called Tooth of Crime. Rehearsed it, everything, did all this. And I didn't realise how fucking difficult it was. Mm. Um, when you're doing gigs uh, every night, you move, you'll do something slightly different. When you're doing a play, you've got to be rigid to that script. And it was sometimes uh, you'd feel absolutely, you know, you, you're doing it every night. And sometimes it was so difficult to lift your hands above your waist. And what do you do with your hands when you're acting? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, was, it was a totally different experience. And I thought, fucking hell, you know. I mean, I'm sure that... Um, actors would find it the same if they went on stage yeah well, i was going to ask then so in that case then the first time you went on stage and the first time you went on stage as an actor was you more scared as an actor than you was as a as a musician yeah <laughs> hell, yeah because if you fuck it up if you fuck it up as a musician um you go oh, you just look at the bass player usually <laughs> and you just go and they think it's them yeah all right or you look at the guitarist you go mm. but if you're playing with other people in the cast and they know they've got their get got, got to get their cue off of you uh and fuck you know well, the first time we did it i actually forgot my lines but um yeah i was working with people who'd been to acting school and all that sort of stuff you know and i think there was a bit of animosity there because i did i wasn't um it was what's it called it, it um in the round or something it round, wasn't yeah yeah, you know, it was just a, a little thing. But it was a really, really interesting experience to do, you know. So, so it just scared you straight off from, I'm never, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm all right singing and performing on stage and, and doing my other stuff, but fuck that noise. Well, um, acting, I, I don't know. It's a bit like when you, um, I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but uh, one time uh, um, um, people, people always say, you know, it's like a classic thing. Oh, well, you know, I could do a pornographic movie. Right, I'll get your clothes off. Yeah. I, well, it's eight people here. Yeah, well, if you do a pornographic film, there's going to be 20 people here with lights and Christ knows what. So get your clothes off and get an hard on. Go on. And, uh, and put, put, your, put your thing there. Um, I can't, well, there you go. You can't do it. Um, and it's that same thing of like, um, all right, uh, try and look natural when someone's pointing the camera at you. You can't do it. Yeah. Um, and there was these two blokes, two Dutch blokes who come around and did this film, which ended up being, there is no authority but yourself. And they came around my house. And uh, I went, oh, do you want some coffee? And I went, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I opened a cup of doors, you know, literally just, get the, I went, are you filming? And they went, yeah. And I couldn't do it. I was so self-conscious. I couldn't get the coffee out without sort of like, oh, it was all suddenness. And I went, you've got to turn the cameras off, mate. Yeah. It's a very strange thing, just... You know. Well, in my former life, I used to make radio documentaries, and it's amazing how people react once you put a mic in their face. Because you'll you'll notice that people will start shifting away from the mic, and because yeah. it, it's just so unnatural. And I think it's a case that they realise that their whatever they do or whatever they say, and if it's film, what however you react is now being kept, and someone now has that. So if you say or or do something that looks a bit weird, you're automatically judging yourself. And and I think that's where people kind of don't come natural to either acting or performing or or whatever. It is like you, you're self criticizing yourself, and and you're just so worried, and you just like you say, you just kind of freeze up. And it's it's a bit like the first time you hear your own voice through headphones. Yeah, yeah. My God, do I really say? Oh, okay, okay, no, I It's like, do I Or the first time you see yourself on film. Yeah. Oh, fucking hell. Yeah, it's weird. 
yeah the, the devastating reali- realization i have one of the biggest noses in the world was was a hard-hitting thing when i can remember doing something in college and just thinking is, is that my fucking nose i thought i was a yeah. good lucky man what the fuck happened but uh, for us people with big noses <laughs> just remember what caesar did <laughs> murdered a lot of people <laughs> well, yeah. there you go mate <laughs> Can't be worse than Donald. Um, <laughs> there you go. Well, let's keep it light because it's meant to be a Christmas special episode. How are you around Christmas? Are you a Christmas guy, or are you kind of one of those people who are like it just—it's another day. Let's just keep keep going. Yeah, I'd, I'd, um, I used to do the Christmas thing because Yana likes it, my wife, you know. But um, uh, because it's just, it's just not for me. Um, and there's something you know. Um, I've never been into, obviously I'm vegetarian, mm. uh, but I've never been to roast dinners. So what the fuck are we eat? You know, we'll have the roast dinner thing. Well, fuck, and then people come around, we thought like we've just been to our auntie. We've had, um, so one year, uh, me and Yoni just had pasta, uh, yeah. spaghetti with um, um, olive oil and garlic in it. And that was our Christmas dinner. And, and then, uh, of course, that leaves you room to eat all the goody bits, like the chocolates and the things, you know. Um, so... No, we'll have, you know, we'll have a little sort of, some sort of tree. Uh, we've got a little bush that we bring indoors and put lights around it. We, we can sort of get into it. Yeah. Um, but the the consumery, uh, getting stressed, uh, you know, uh, we've got no kids, so I mean, I've got to worry about that. Uh, um, I don't mind it, but it's um, just wish they'd put something decent on TV. I've got my TV guide for Christmas this year, and... A whole day on, I think it's Christmas Eve, is carry on films. For fuck's sake. Sin one, Sid James go, ha, 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 ha. where's all the bird shit? Ha, ha, ha. Uh, and that's it, you've seen it. You know, I don't, and Barbara Windsor, bless her, what a loss. You know, what a, what a great actress. Um, you know, that's the sad thing, but, um, um, and Home Alone, of course. And of course, then you've got, you know, in, in some way, I'm glad that I can't go to the pub. Because now I've not got to suffer. It's Christmas. Oh God! Dun, 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 dun. And when the sleigh bells ring, the slow t- 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 oh, and there's going to be Cliff any minute. Here he comes. <laughs> and this one's Owen. Blah 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 blah. And I'm coming on for Christmas. T- 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 and here it comes. Do 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 do. Oh, for fuck's sake! Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Are you not? Yeah, I'm a very, what, I'm a very Christmassy sort of guy. I, I feel like I've picked the right person for this episode. Um, I mean, like, so you're not a fan of any Christmas songs at all, then? There's like none that you go, oh, that's, that's pretty decent, actually. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, nuts roasting on an open fire. Right, I live in a block of flats. Step uh, Into no. Christmas by Elton John is a tune, mate. It's a good song. Oh, the thing is, I used to really like Elton John when he'd done Yellow Brick Road, Rocket Man, and all that sort of stuff. But he got into this, um, his voice has changed, the way he sings. Uh, and instead of saying, and if I, he, and he always goes, and if I, and it's this real um, mid-Atlantic uh, American voice, uh, da, 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 and I don't like it no more. Well, did you ever no. see that COVID video he did where about a load of celebrities got together to raise some money? And I, I think he sang, oh, what was he singing? Oh, I Can't Dance. And it literally was like, dear, 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 dear. It wasn't pronouncing like any of the vowels. It was just like, what are you doing, man? This is so weird. I, I know. It's, it's a bit like, um, I love it to death. Um, Amy Winehouse. Yeah. Uh, you can dig my this We end up getting my eyes. What? <laughs> I mean, I know my accent is shit. And um, someone from France wouldn't understand it. And certainly um, our wonderful, wonderful prime minister. <laughs> And thank you for allowing us to have a Christmas, but make it little. <laughs> and for assuring us that next year, Christmas will be here. Thank you so much, you fucking disheveled fucking arsehole. But uh, there you go. Don't let's go down, let's go up. Begins to run. 
freedom has no value. If violence is the price, I want a revolution. I want anarchy and peace. You talk about buying power. You finance as your soul. You take a liberation and when a faithful role. Well, I need faithful role right now. We're still for that place. Just another set of spinners. Their rifles are to me. But what about those people? You know, what's your new restrictions? What about Christmas as a kid? Was that something you enjoyed as a kid, or was it something that you just like? Again, that you saw it as kind of materialistic and not for me. No, I did like it. I liked it very much because it was the whole. Um, I think because uh, then I was living with the family, um, and it was the routines. I don't know. There's something comforting about it. Um, in those days, uh, you, uh, I'm talking about the uh, '60s, uh, and you'd 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 make paper, you'd stick the paper chains together, you know, and do all that, and you put tinsel up, and uh, it was very exciting. And um, I mean, I sort of knew very. My brother told me that Santa Claus, you know, Father Christmas didn't exist. Uh, thanks for that, Dave. <laughs> Um, you know, burst my bubble, why don't you? And uh, but no, I used to really, really enjoy it. You know, as a kid, um, really enjoy it. But the older I got, the more it, and certainly now, uh, when you you know you go to buy your shopping um, in October, and they've they've already got the Christmas crackers out, and it's like for fuck's sake, you know. Um, and just that bit colours it. I don't know. Maybe the pagans should do something about it and bring it back to the way it used to be. Sort of all running around naked, bit cold though, running around naked. But you know, let's talk about yourself then. And um, you grew up in a period where a lot of people kind of see it as like the greatest music here of the sixties and seventies. I mean, you had artists like Hendrix, Beatles, Elvis, Dylan, Beach Boys, Aretha Franklin, Bowie, who I know you've spoken about of having a passion for. Uh, I mean, how much music was in your life growing up, and was it something that was kind of in your household as well, like on the radio, or was it something that you kind of was very precious to you that you kept away from home? Uh, no, when, when I grew up, I was living with my grandparents, um, and they were um, obviously been Christ. I was born in fucking hell, nineteen oh three or something like that. I mean, um, so they've been through two world wars. Uh, rationing had stopped. Uh, uh, I was born in '57. I think rationing stopped in 1954 or '55. I don't know. Go gobble that. Yeah. Um, so everything was like really. And I remember um, Turkey was never heard of. You know, um, the, the uh, obviously it's when I was eating meat when I was a kid. It was a roast chicken for for Christmas dinner or a bit of roast pork. You know, um, booze you never bloody got up and all this stuff. But music-wise, um, the the music we used to listen to was what my grandparents used to like to listen to, and my grandmother's favourite was, God help us, Frank Frankie Ifield. I remember you. Uh, she used to love the Black and White Minstrel Show, for example, and all those that, that old um, um, uh, uh, jazz yep. thing, you know. Um, and my grand my grandfather used to like brass bands. Um, but we did have a radiogram eventually, and of course we had um, uh, Ready Steady Go, uh, the Six Five Special, I think it was called, programs for younger people. Um, and uh, and my mum was a bit younger, so of course there was things on the radio, but it was just things like uh, what you just hear on the radio. Yeah. Um, so I never really took much notice of that. You know, I, I sort of knew who the Beatles were. I knew who. Um, Kathy Kirby was, for example, because she always had, wore that bright lipstick. Uh, Shirley Bassey um, was always, my God, you know, I could almost see her nipples, you know, because she always wore these red, very revealing things, you know. So, um, uh, and the Walker Brothers thing. So it wasn't until really I didn't become aware of music um, until 1969, 1968, 1969. And I was sitting, uh, uh, and I remember it was summer, uh, sitting on a friend's doorstep. Uh, back doorstep, and this uh, bloke from next door came walking down in a in this amazing suit, uh, which shimmered in two colours, uh, and he had a shaven head with two partings in it. Went in and put on this amazing, uh, put on this record, and all of a sudden it was like, I said, yeah, boom, fifty four, five, six, and that's it. I was lost hmm. uh, to scar, and that was my first real introduction to music so so was it a case of like seeing this like extravagant looking man and then the music as well or, or like for you or do you think if you just saw someone who was like in a suit and a tie and he was listening to to that music you would have you would still had that kind of interaction no because it wasn't just it was a two-tone suit and it was the first skin i've ever, I'd ever seen yeah 
um, and uh, the music was amazing. And we sort of, me and my mate sort of stood up and went, oh, what the fuck is that? And that was the first point I thought, I want, now I want my own identity. I want to look like that. Um, as, uh, um, but then after that, um, I was taken uh, um, uh, by my sister to see a film called West Side Story. Um, and this is when cinemas uh, um, just had one big screen. Yeah. I mean, just huge. And the, uh, just the overture and all those colours on the screen, but the music. And uh, from that point on, I was lost. And that's when I got into Motown uh, and Burt Bacharach uh, because, of, because of the uh, the brass and the violins. And I think ever since I saw West Side Story, I've always been trying to fight. You know, I've always, when I play, you know, plunk about on piano, I've always been trying to find out how to play um, tonight because just that's you know just those hanging chords and things. Um, so that's I think where it comes from for me. Uh, um, obviously, I've got into the Beatles and uh, you know Abbey Road. I think is one of their is one of my favourite of, of theirs. You know, uh, then of course there was Bowie, but then you've got the Who. Um, and you know, but that's I think that was my that that scar fifty four five six was like boom. I've got me on identity. I can listen to what I want to, which I started doing. So how quickly did then then you start adapting into like the the, the image of a skinhead? Like we were, were you like obviously I I don't know when you started shaving your heads, but um, were you were you instantly like that's it? I'm going home. Where's the clippers? I'm getting rid. Yeah. Uh, I, I literally saved up money, um, and uh, first of all, I got my hair cut, cropped, and actually, everyone liked it. <laughs> my parents and grandparents, oh, well, that's a lovely haircut, you know. But then I had to save up and save up, and uh, I, I had to have a. Uh, obviously, I couldn't afford a Ben Sherman, um, so it was uh, uh, everybody was doing copies. Yeah, um, you go down Marks, not Marks and Spencer's, but I don't know Woolworths, and you could get a cheap copy of a of a you know button down collar shirt so you vaguely look something like it um because it's a bit like the, the punk thing when it came out oh you know um, it's all about your own identity yeah but i want to look like you know someone else so you go down to sex um you know at the king's road and it would be so expensive you'd have to save up for it or, yeah. or nick it, you know um, and it was the same with the skinhead thing you know i never ever had the proper stuff you know because it was so expensive did you do that then did you go down to sex and like because obviously that's like a notorious shop whereabouts everyone kind of knows it's vivian westwood's and uh, malcolm mclaren's kind of empire did you go in then and if you did did you find it like kind of i've heard stories of it being quite elitist like you walk in there and all of a sudden you're judged whereabouts punk was meant to be like his free spirit of of like be whatever you want to be I mean, if you did go, was that how did you find it? I went down there with uh, two friends, and I, um, we were just, I weren't going to buy anything; just went in there just to see. And uh, I was confronted by this woman with, wearing uh, uh, contact lenses, black contact lenses, uh, and I was like, "What's up with your eyes?" And she went, "Oh, it's contact lenses." I was like, "All oh, right." And we sort of stood there and looked around, and then fucked off again. <laughs> it was uh, quite intimidating. It turned out that woman was Jordan. And I met her, you know, a couple of years ago, and she's a lovely woman, you know, um, and I'd advise anyone, if you want to know about those times, read her fucking book. I'm not liking it, but do read her book, you know, Defying Gravity. It's a real insight. But um, I think that's what it was all about. It was all about you walking in. If you're coming in to buy something, you're here for a reason. Explain what that reason is. And in a way, in an arty sort of way, I'll get that. But on the other hand, I just sort of want to look around, mate. But I'm intimidated, so fuck it. I'll, I'll go down a cheaper shop then and get me fluorescent socks there then and get them cheaper. Back from the Roxy, OK. I never must supply in there anyway. Said I only want it, well behaved, but Do they think a thousand market phones are just fucking toys? Fuck them, shut up to make my stand Against what I feel is wrong with this land Just sit there on their other fed ass Feeling off the sweat of less fortunate class Give the fucking power, cut their fingers on the bun Got control, won't let it be forgotten Do the very allergies, the wrong and ever can Do the name Belfast, that's the fucking fun See you in the squad, lying in the front yard See you in the machine gun You're also a person who's known for loving literature and the words, um, and and you got into poetry, I believe, at quite a young age. How how did that play into being like a, a young, a, a young East End l- lad skinhead? 
also getting into this world that I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but would be seen as quite effeminate and kind of like not the macho macho image that would be betrayed in that time. Uh, you've just said it. You know, uh, um, that's what I was judged at. If, um, I'm going to use their terms as they spoke in, in those days. And uh, what's that, you know, what's that book you've got? It's poetry. A? Uh, yeah, it's a bloke called Walt Whitman. Who? Oh, I was an American bloke and he was, uh, he was in a civil war. And he writes about people being shot in a civil war. And, you know, it's, it's really, really good. You know, well, you fucking puff. Uh, well, I, no, but I just like that. You fucking puff. What? you want? To, it's like that Billy Elliot film. Yeah. You want to be a fucking dancer? You puff. What, you puff? Have you seen ballet dance? They're fuck, they've got muscles on fucking muscles. I would never take on a ballet dance in a fucking fight because you, you are coming down, mate. And in the end, I was like, well, I don't care. Uh, because there was something about reading those words, uh, and I was never really into the American Civil War, but the way that um, there's a one uh, poem that Walt Whitman uh, writes, um, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom, and it's about these uh, couple get a letter uh, from their son, who's been sh who's obviously been killed in, in the in the Civil War, and that to me was really, you know, I wanted to write like that. Um, and after that, I discovered uh, Graham Greene, uh, Brighton Rock, um, and then I discovered uh, Barry Hines, Stan Barstow, and the Sinato, those sort of writers, and it would they were talk rather than reading books like uh, The Line of Witch and the Wardrobe or um, um, Swallows and Amazons, where it's all these upper class or middle class kids going to, we're going to school and we're taking our luggage. I we take your you come home at half past three. Oh no, it's all, and it's all, look here. I say, da, 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 the minute I read uh, Kess by Barry Hines, at last you're talking about me. So did you try and like find a community of people who enjoyed poetry? Did you ever go to like a poetry read or even stand up on stage and, and perform poetry? No, the sort of poetry I was, I was writing at the time was that typical la 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 la, like uh, birthday card stuff. Yeah. La 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 rhyme la 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 rhyme and it wasn't until I met um uh Penny Rambo and and G uh, and the Dal uh, the people who were living at Dal House that time which became known as Crasso um that they actually encouraged me uh because I was very embarrassed about it and they they really encouraged me and, and it was a guy called Dick LeBeau uh who uh put me on to Walt Whitman and it was Penny Rambo who said, um, well, try and read this book, and it was On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Uh, well, I couldn't fucking read it because there was no punctuation. So I was getting out of breath reading it. I'm like... Uh, and uh, then he said, try this one. And it was um, Last Exit to Brooklyn by Hubert Selby Jr. Yeah. And that I clipped into straight away because it was about working class, the, the, the fights, drinking, all this kind of thing. Um so yeah, that's that's how I got into that, you know. But um, but I, you know, I certainly wasn't a poet. I didn't see myself as a poet, but I just wanted to write something, you know. David Bowie was writing these songs uh, that meant something to me, and I thought, you know, I'm sure I can do that. I mean, how confusing was it for you then, like growing up, whereabouts? The, the people who you surrounded yourself with were like the working class people of Dagenham. And then all of a sudden you're meeting this kind of hippie, middle class guy like Penny who understood you or got you or tried to get you. I, I like, obviously we, we kind of pretend now that we don't live in a class system, but we still do. But I've got friends now who, who are rich, poor, whatever. And, and it doesn't seem like much of a deal, but I, me in my kind of ignorance, I would see it like in the 60s or 70s, it was still like a big deal. Yeah, it certainly was. Yeah. Um, and I just will, um, when I went to a uh, dial house, uh, and I was like, oh, this is amazing, you know, because uh, there was a guy called George Tarbuck, uh, who became George Fingers Tarbuck. He played on a, a on the Peel sessions on piano and there was a piano at Dalhouse, house and quite often George Tarbuck would come over and start playing piano playing Elton John songs and me and him would be singing together you know and stuff like that and so I thought it was oh this is an amazing place you know if you want to draw you can draw if you want to cook you can cook hmm. I mean I remember G saying um, do you want to learn how to cook and I went yeah and she went well get, get the rice down I went okay which one is the rice and she went that one oh, okay 
I didn't fucking have a fucking pearl barley. Like, Jesus Christ. I made a bit of jeez. <laughs> you ever try to eat pearl but It comes out the way it goes in. It's fucking awful. Anyway, <laughs> but, um, so all this stuff. So I was in this real cop. So I went back to Dagenham. I've been to this amazing place. And part of me thought I should take them. But the other, the other part of me was like, no, because they'll fuck it. Mm. Um, it, it um, and I, I've got to keep this one for me. Um, um, but that proved me wrong when later it was crass and there were working class kids. If I, Let's use that term. There was working class kids coming from all over the world to stay at Dole House and there was no class structure. It, it just made no difference. Yeah. So it was okay, but you had to respect it. And, and I think that um, uh, going back to what you you know was already originally saying was that, yeah, it, it, it didn't, it was something I, it was my escape and I had to have that for me to get out of there. And that's, I suppose that's it really. Well, let's talk a little bit about punk then, because it's quite well known. You've told it quite a few times that you went to a Clash show and and you saw them perform. And that was kind of like, I can do that. Like, I, I want to do that. What was it about the Clash then that you that you saw and went, OK, like, yeah, the, I'm enjoying what they're doing, but I can do better. Where, where where was like the kind of thinking behind that? I went in there and I saw, I saw the Clash play and I was like, just fucking blown away. Literally, I mean, it was just... I can't describe just, oh, I've got goose pimples now, you know, just how, bam, fucking hell, you know, this is, this is it, this, yeah. you know, just, and when Joe Strummer went, and people were going, oh, your shit, your shit, and all this, and throwing plastic glasses or whatever, and he went, well, if you think you'll do better, start your own band, and I thought, right, I will, never think I ever could, coming from Dagnum, I mean, uh, my musical thing, uh, was you'd go down the local pub uh, at a weekend and there'd be a resident band there with an organ, you know, and um, uh, drums and a guitar. And they'd be playing things like Sorrow or, um, you know, when you begin the begin, you know, to, or um, I'm forever blowing, but you'd know, be playing all these bloody songs. I was always like, well, of course I'd like to be a pop star, um, but where the fuck do I buy a guitar in Dagenham? Where do I, if I want to be a trumpet and a jazz, where the fuck do I buy a trumpet? And secondly, how do you play it? To be a musician, uh, you've got to read music and you've got to do all this. I don't know how to do that. When uh, The Clash said that, I was like, right, I'm going to start a band. And then I realised when I met Penn, no, um, you haven't got to learn music. And that's the wonderful thing about that Clash. And that's why I've always loved The Clash. Mm. You know, I, I have to say that, you know, that first album they did. Um, that opened doors for me because it you didn't have to go to um, a, a musical college. You could just sit down there with two knit and needles on a biscuit tin. That was your drum kit. And you just say what you want to do. That's what opened the doors for me. So at what point then, so you go back to the farm and, and you say to Penny, I want to start a band. At what point do you go, okay, let's start a band, but we want it to have a message. And our message is going to be this kind of, anarchist sound i mean at what point did you start thinking like that or was it just something that's natural no it's just something that's natural it just happened. i mean me and ben uh i, went, I remember saying ben, uh, he goes to me um and it was just me and him no one else was there pen goes what are you up to and oh, i think it's starting a punk band he went oh well um i've got a drum kit i'll play drums for you i went really he went yeah and he said what we're we gonna call ourselves i mean um how about stormtrooper yeah now like we didn't call ourselves that didn't it? <laughs> I can see the I can see the cover now, leather thongs, and, and uh, I mean the first songs I wrote were fucking pretty dire, but uh, I wrote I was living, and um, and it just came out, and it wasn't that, um, and people picked up on that. It wasn't I mean I, you know it wasn't we had this, let's do this and we'll do that, uh, and that, um, and I remember um, it was first of all me and Pem were just going to be a drums and vocals outfit because no one else was doing it, and I was like, oh, well okay then. Right, let's do that because it's exciting. We thought um, it wouldn't get further than the garden gate. We would just shock people that come around. We just sort of perform in the gardens. Sort of um, but the more people joined, the more songs we started to write. And it was like, oh, fucking hell, people are listening. You know, um, then we started fucking up playing live. So then we, we stopped getting out of it so much and concentrated on that. 
Um, and but it, there was never ever a point of like, um, right, we'll do this. We'll call the band crash, and we'll all wear black, and we'll do this, and we'll have this and that, and but it, it was all um, as Penny Rambo says. It just came, and it was other people that went, oh my god, and it's. And I've spent the rest of my life explaining it wasn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, I'm... Steve. So, Steve, do you like Christmas? Yeah, fucking happy Christmas. Fuck the blitzy morning. It's something I want to say. Man, I stand out nation. Why not trust the night? That's all I give you shit. Drop your in a pit. Try and try and try and get happy. Drop it because they pass your mouth. Then you're born in trouble. The valley must have been. This is just a trouble. It's not to you, Amy. so for people of my generation I, I think it's hard to comprehend how encompassing punk was like between 77 and 79 in the uk like was it really just punk swallowed the country and that was it and everyone was shocked and clutching their pearls or, or do you think it's come a lot more nostalgic now and people like to kind of blow it up than what it was the minute you dyed your hair or or wore plastic sandals or fluorescent socks or wore anything different uh you were in for a good kicking and I'm serious about that. Uh, for me, it was, this is my time. I'm going to get into this. This is for working class kids. This ain't for intellect. Well, it is for intellectuals. Um, but uh, this time round, it's a bit like, uh, we're not like the hippies. We're in peace and love, man. And we'd like a better life, please. Uh, punk went, oh, we're the punk rock and we want a different life now. And if we don't get it, you're going to get a fucking kick in the edge, you bastard. That was the difference. Um, so it was like, um, and to just be able to piss off your parents was fucking brilliant. To, um, and to have battle scars from from you know, uh, walking down the street, you know, we're talking about 15 year old kids being beaten up by 30 year old blokes. So for you then, when you got the opportunity to kind of take all that rage and take all that anger and go to a studio when you record uh, your first album, The Feeding of the 5000, and, and you spoke about do they owe us a living which i think is like still it's amazing how the songs that you wrote back then still resonate now and going into a studio and having that opportunity and having that mic in your hand for the first time and in the studio and having watched the clash like was it a case of fuck i'm living i'm living it i'm living my punk dream uh, sorry to disappoint you no <laughs> um no it was never like that it's just like right we're doing this and we're not doing it like that we're doing it like this yeah, I agree with you. Um, we're just doing this thing. I don't care if people like it. It's not until uh, um, now um, when people come and talk to me. Now I'll get a sense of what it is that, you know, for whatever reason. I mean, that song, uh, Do Thou Was Living, is timeless. It's, it does what it says on the tin, if you know what I mean. Mm. And I'm very proud to have fucking done that. But it's only now when people come up and say, Steve, thanks for changing my life, you know, that I get a sense of what we actually... Because before social media, which they, there was no internet back in those days, you never had an idea. And it's only now uh, that I realise uh, um, that those those songs, those words, um, and conflict and poison girls and subhumans and all the rest of the bands, you know, those songs are still to that to this day still relevant. Do you think that you kind of spoke about obviously no internet in 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 the seventies? Do you think if if the if you had social media and the internet that you that you had back then, do you think Crass would have made a, as much noise, or do you think they would have got drowned out by everyone else's noise? You know, but that's a really good question because I've often thought about that, and yeah, I don't know. Could if if Crass started tomorrow, would they could they last? I, I think we might be overshadowed by the sleeping bods or something. Is that um, a, is that a band you look at now and go, oh, I can I can definitely like understand what they're doing and where they're trying to do and, and what they're saying is that is that a, like a band that you kind of compare us with, with crass oh oh fucking hell first time i heard them uh matt uh Worley, 
mate of mine who went, oh, listen to this. Um, hate's a strong word when I use it against you when I'm pushing my little girl for the pub. And fuck you. And I'm like, that's what I should have done when I left Crass. Of course, you know. Uh, um, but, it's, um, but also there's, you've got um, um, Bobby Villain out yep. now. You know, uh, fuck you, we live here. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and if I had a chance to work with those people, I would do it at the, at the you know, yeah, I'd do it. You know, but... Um, Going back to that, I, I think the crash was of its time. Uh, we were writing about then, but the problem is it's still relevant now, hmm. and that's the weird thing. I could come out and do a crash gig tomorrow, and it would still make sense. That's the weird. So, um, if I go to bed tonight and I read Charles Dickens, that's still relevant. I read um, that someone stated that the Sex Pistols sang the words, but Crass lived them. Was there an element of? Of from the outside looking in and looking at the Sex Pistols and what they were doing that kind of built up an anger. That, that may be me putting words in your mouth. I don't know. Say that again. So essentially what I'm asking you was like the Sex Pistols kind of everyone looks at the Sex Pistols. Well, not everyone. A lot of people look at the Sex Pistols and see them as the image of punk of its time. Me personally, I saw them as Malcolm McLaren's boy band. Like they were created because he went to America came to the UK and and he wanted to create a Richard Hell band and that's what happened to the Sex Pistols but I'm not going to go the Sex Pistols on punk because people who enjoy punk saw them as that so therefore fine okay that's fine for you who was who was living bunny ears the punk lifestyle and how did you see that how did you see the Sex Pistols who were marketing punk in the way that they were um I th- I thought they would um I have to say, back in the day, I thought they were fantastic. You know, I mean, I, um, the minute I hear the the opening chords of um, um, Anarchy in the UK, mm. uh, my hairs go up. You know, but I look at the I look at certain members of that band today, and I'm like, you know, I don't think I can ever listen to your music again because of what you've been supporting or what you've been saying. Yeah. You know, um, I'm sure you can read behind the lines here, and yeah. You can look at all of those bands. Uh, that's the shame of it. Um, you can look at all of them uh, and go, yeah, you know, Generation X and Billy Idol, you know. Um, and it all became just a fucking pantomime. And the worst thing, I, I think the worst thing was that all of those bands, um, apart from the Buzzcocks, I have to say, um, all went to, fucked off to America and never came back. Or if they did, they came back as a polished rock and roll band. And that was the shame of it. It's easy to forget um, that uh, the first look at the Sex Pistols was them looking so outrageous, you know, and the actual look of them. Um, and that was the main thing. Um, what they said then came, and that was brilliant. But then what came after that was all a bit disappointing. You kind of touched a little bit on like the, the, the violence that kind of surrounded punk. And like one of the things that is kind of that is just as synonymous as the music you created was the crass logo uh that dave yeah. king created um and and it kind of it kind of at the time i believe it was misconstrued by a lot of like the far right as this nordic kind of logo i mean how much trouble did that cause you as a band and because crass will yeah crass were quite well known for just basically going to the left and the right fuck off like we don't want to deal with your petty bullshit yeah, how much how much hassle did that actually create you? Um, not not real lot, um, because what we realised was that the crash symbol did look a bit, but that couldn't can look like a swastika. To, to, um, oh, that can look like the Union flag, you know, mm. um, because it's only a, a jack when it's on a boat. Sorry, you don't like boat, but um, yeah, it looks like a Union flag. Oh, blimey! Um, plus, we had these people. Um, are you are you right wing? No. Oh, you must be fucking lefties. No. Are you left wing? No. Oh, you must be fucking right wing. No. So that's why you put up the um uh, the peace symbol to show that we uh, or the CND thing to show which was also um a peace symbol, you know, the CND thing. Um, and then we put up the A, uh, the A in the circle to show that we were anarchists, that we were not political at all. So all the time, in the end, we end up with all these banners. I mean, you'd come to a crash gig. And it'd be like there's a fucking washing line up there with all these <laughs> sheets on me. Jesus Christ, how much do we have to justify what we're doing? That, that, that crest symbol is all over the world. Yeah. 
you know, it's, it's on people's arms, legs, it's on people's bodies, um, it's on T-shirts, it's on walls, and it's bigger than fucking Tesco's. The band broke up in 84. Was there a point yeah. before that where actually you were like, I'm done with this? Or was it, because I've heard that you always, 84 was always the date that you always had in mind, like, that's it, this is going to run the line. I've no? got to stop you there. No, I don't know where you got that from, and I don't know why I've seen interviews with Penny Rambo, and he says, you know, oh, it, it, was, it wasn't. Because um, on our records, we used to have um, a 721984, so it was a countdown to 1984. Yeah. And I remember saying to Penn, right, this is all well and good. What happens when it actually, if we're still going in 1984, what did we do then, Penn? And he went, oh, we'd just do minus or something like that. I went, oh, okay then. But it just happened, it was that coincidence that we left that last gig, uh, which turned out to be last gig, and Andy Palmer went, I'm gonna leave, I want to leave the band. And it literally was just that. Yeah. So so was it Andy who wanted to leave or what was it a case of like for yourself? Because I, I know we, we've kind of spoken very briefly before when um, when we did a benefit show for uh, Punks Against Sweatshops. And I asked you the question of like, could like would would the crass crowd like would allowed you to write a kind of like a love song or something like that like were you itching to do something different um or were you quite content with the world that you've created for yourself no i think by the end of it um uh, that, that was the weird thing because um when we uh, going back to that last gig um we got in a van um and it was 20 minutes down the road and andy palmer went uh i want to I jack it in i want to leave the band and there was this, I think it was me and a couple of others, Eve Liberty, man, but, oh, no, Andy, don't, don't, Andy. And then I went all quiet. And 20 minutes later, well, I think it was me, and I said, tell the truth, Andy, if it hadn't been you, it would have been me. Hmm. I think by that time, we were all burnt out. I remember um, in 1983, uh, the year before, there'd been a lot of heavy, heavy discussions about where to take the band next. It would be seen as terrorism now. But how to, um, I'm talking about in the 80s. So, how to take out the com communications in the middle of London just to fuck it up, you know, and that kind of thing. Not killing people or anything like that, but, you know, that for me, that was, um, this wasn't my style of the band. You know, I started a band to sort of get drunk and get stung and get fucking shagged or whatever or get beaten up, you know. So, when uh, that happened, it was a sigh of relief. Um, and it wasn't until we stopped Crass that um, suddenly there was colour. It was like, oh, God, I ain't got to do that no more. I ain't got to wear that no more. Yeah. I haven't got to be this no more. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, there was a part of it, it was like, oh, fuck, when that guy came up to me and he goes, are, are you st didn't you used to be in that band called Crass? Yeah, fucking hell, you know, I'm now an old has -been. I mean, you kind of touched on it, but how was it moving away from being Steve Ignorant, the vocalist from Crass, to being Steve Williams, where actually you wanted to do your own things? I mean, you, you've had a successful career away from Crass with other bands. So was it difficult for, for you personally? And did you feel like it was a weight of, like, Crass is always going to be a part of my life and I don't want it to be right now? Because you seem to, have, you've definitely embraced Crass, I think, a lot more. As, as you've got older, I mean, this is someone who doesn't know you at all, but from the outside looking in, was it a case at time where about you're like, fuck crass, man, like, I, I'm done. Like, that was something that I did, and, and I want to be known for the person who's what I'm doing now. Of course. Um, but how the fuck do you do it? You know, uh, I mean, you know, I'm not having to go at anybody uh, from uh, crass, but when crass finished, uh, it was amazing because uh, Phil Free and Eve Lib uh, and uh, Joy DeViva had moved away anyway. Pete Wright wasn't living at Dark House, so it had all split. Um, obviously, Andy was off. Uh, Penny Rambo went back to writing his book, uh, books. Um, Jay went back to doing artwork. Uh, uh, Phil Free and Joy, I think, were working at a health food shop. Uh, Pete Wright went back to doing his, you know, his DIY sort of building stuff. And what was left for me? Uh, what do I do? Go back to working in the supermarket, which was the last job I had. Fuck it, um, shit, uh, and there was no support. I was gone. It was gone. Um, I couldn't uh, pick up the phone and say to Paul Weller, for example, "Oh, Paul, do you fancy doing a, you know, fancy doing an album together?" Or I couldn't do that. I was right back on my own. No one in Crass wanted to do another band because we just done Crass. And I was like, "Well, I've got this acoustic thing. Uh, 
Um, so I knew I wanted to do something uh, different, uh, but there was nothing. You know, I was into rap at the time, as I said, and that's where I got in touch with conflict. Hmm. But um, yeah, I was I was totally lost, totally lost. You know, um, with no support, um, and I I was up there, and all of a sudden I'm like, fucking hell, shit. And I remember looking in the in the uh, local paper uh, for jobs, um, and I was already I was 29 years old, and I was already in a scrappy. Because yeah. uh, I've done qualifications. What have you been doing for the last seven years? Um, screaming down a microphone. <laughs> but, you know, that ain't going to get a fucking job. Um, and um, I, I, I sort of knew um, that the because I've been Steve Ignorant from Crass, that would always give me a foot in the door, if you know what I mean. Um, so, of course, I've used that. And, and, and the funny thing is that every band I joined, uh, like Conflict, you know, I had to leave that in the end because I, I had these ideas of what I wanted to do. But it, that wasn't fair because it was Colin's band. Um, then I was in a band called, um, oh, fucking hell, Schwarzenegger. Um, and that went somewhere else. That was getting there, but ego problems there. Then I was in was in a band with Gary from Dirt, Stratton Mercenaries, almost getting there. But I remember saying to Gary when we first started that band, you know, I went, oh, you know, Gary, I've got this idea, I want to do acoustic stuff. And he went, I, I, I said, I'm fed up with that three called French shit. He went, I am as well. Fuck me, you know, um, a year into the band, I went, right, okay, I've got an acoustic thing. He went, I don't play acoustic. I went, what? He went, I don't play acoustic. I went, fuck, that's no reason. No, so I believe that one. And it weren't until I met Pete and Carol and Pete um, with Slice of Life that I was able to do the stuff that I always wanted to do. Hmm. It's an acoustic thing. You know, I realise, and I've said this to the slices as well, when we go to gigs, all people want to talk to me about is crass. I don't give a fuck. The way I see it, if people have been out on a shitty Wednesday night when it's pissing the rain to come to a crass gig uh, to see me scream and get beaten up for it, or if they've bought my record or they've bought a pair of socks or whatever, the least I can give them is five minutes of my time. So something that's a bit left field for people uh, might know this. Um, you, you've, you've become a, a volunteer lifeboatman in the area that you live in. and I, I, I was. I'm not anymore. I'm okay. too old now. I was. Yeah. Okay. Um, because the reason that you kind of came back to Crass was was to do a benefit show to raise money for the, for the people in, in the... In, uh, I, I don't know what the actual word is. Lifeboat community. I yeah, know. yeah, yeah. And um, if it wasn't for that, do you think you would have gone back to Crass at all? Uh, no, that's a really weird thing because what happened was that me and Yona uh, moved up to. Um, me and Mum died and all that sort of thing, so there was no written message anymore. And Yona go. We we were living in a, um, a you know like Brookside. Yeah, you know, Close. like what? Yeah, yeah, one of them. Living in one of them. The other guys want to move. I mean, oh, for fuck's sake. Went to look at Cambridge, fuck that. All oh, lorries and fucking straight roads. Went to Lincolnshire, fuck that. Man. Jesus Christ. I ain't fucking living there. Uh, went to North, came to Norfolk, uh, drove over the bridge, and it was just, for her, it was just like Holland. And for me, it was like being in Essex again before it had been fucked up by um, London spread down. So we moved it. Fucking weren't here um, two months. Phone call. Right, um, Steve, uh, blah, blah. Would uh, You've got a 30-minute slot. Hammersmith, um, Palais. Bus cops are playing. Conflicts are playing. Blah, blah, playing. I went, oh. Yeah, and I worked, really went into it. And, uh, and then a couple of friends come over for dinner, and, and, and I told them about it. And they went, well, why not? I was like, oh. And I, I suddenly got this idea of, like, fucking hell. Oh, Crass never played uh, the Feed Me 5000 album live. So that's what I'll do. Don't announce it. We'll just do it in between. Every other, we'll go in between stiff little fingers and or whatever. And we just do it and we'll blow everyone else off the stage. We'll go, <clears throat> so I told him about this. It was, and, he, and the phone went dead. He calls back 20 minutes later. He goes, right, we scrap that. 
you want the two nights headline the Shepherd's Bush Empire, blah blah. I'm like, fucking hell. <laughs> and that's where it all started. Um, the, the th- it w- wasn't to do with the lifeboat. Um, but the thing is that um, every gig I do, uh, a bit of money goes to a, some sort of cause and uh, made so much money, I was able to give a load of money to the to the local lifeboat. You know, I've got this money, what do I do with it? And when I want to see where it goes, gave it to them, it was filmed. Um, they bought life jackets with it. So it weren't spent on petrol yeah. or anything like that. Uh, and those life jackets that the punks paid for, everyone who came to those gigs, that's gone on to save lives because I've worn one. So when you were going to do that, did you reach out to the rest of the guys and go, I'm going to do this show, do you fancy doing it? Or was it a case of, this is mine, I want to do this alone, I want to stand on the stage and just enjoy no, it? Was a, no, there was a real fucking problem with that because um, of course it was a Shepherd's Bridge Empire and it's like, oh my God, that's a corporate thing. And, and there's all this fuss. Um, Penny Rambo phoned me and he went, um, Steve, I don't, want you to use I don't want you to use any of my songs. I was like, oh, fuck it. You know, it's all the fucking set going, Jesus Christ. <laughs> fuck, what do I do? What do I do? And everyone was going, Steve, if it weren't for your voice, there wouldn't be a crash if you don't. So they're yours. Fucking do it. And, and in the end, I was like, fuck it. What are they going to do? Sue me. Um, and thank fuck, Penn phone, you know, got in touch. And he went, no, Steve, go for it. I was being silly. Um, so that's the way that me and Penn have always been. It's, um, it, it, I think it, it wasn't, half me didn't want to do it because I thought, oh, I might be, might be destroying uh, the myth. Of crash, if you know what I mean. But the other part of me was like, well, fuck it. Didn't we always say there was there was no gods, no heroes, and no myths and no legends? And and that's why I do it now, um, because it, it, I see myself um, uh, as a bit of an ambassador. Wherever I go, with whatever band I go to, people want to talk to me about crass. And as I said before, if I'm the person they can come up to and see, I will give them my time. Yeah, that's why I don't. That's why I don't use dressing room. I'm always at the bar, so I'm accessible. Thank you so much for talking to me. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you for being so honest and open uh, with me. And um, I hope you and your loved ones have a great Christmas. And uh, you too. 2021 is something that's a little bit better than this. When the sleigh bells ring the snow, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll wish it could be Christmas. So I had case that is just another trade for a fellow country to say. But I'll drop rock of nice things I say. So goes a dish about a bit on a man. Thank you so much to Steve for taking the time to talk to me and I wish him a very happy Christmas. Thank you also to the band who sponsored the podcast at the start of this episode, To The Helpless. Go support them. Go buy some of their stuffs. Uh, A link for the band is in the episode description of this podcast. Please also go show me some love by going to the Apple podcast site. Rate and review the podcast. It costs you nothing but helps the podcast massively. Also, during Christmas, if you haven't got your friends or or family, anything, uh, send them this. Send them the podcast. It costs you fuck all and they might enjoy it. This is the last episode of 2020. We are going to have a little break, but we'll be back in late January 2021. Thank you so much for the support of this year. It has been rough for everyone. It's been a hard one. If you haven't achieved everything you wanted to achieve this year, give yourself some slack. There was a fucking global pandemic. Uh, but let's make 2021 our fucking year, yeah? Let's uh, let's grab it by the throat. And uh, I, I don't know where I was going with that kind of very violent metaphor. Just try and enjoy 2021 is what I'm trying to say. I truly appreciate you. Stay well. Have a very happy Christmas or happy holidays, however you want to say it. And uh, I will see you in the new year. Bye-bye. Hey!